Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing a home insurance policy. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the full test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Tony. Welcome to Alpha Insurance. How can I help you? I'm not happy with my current home insurance, and it is lapsing next month, so I thought I'd look around for something better. Is this for an apartment or a house? It's for a house. And do you need building cover or contents? Just the contents. The building cover is connected to my mortgage right now. Okay, well, I'll just take a few basic details from you and then we'll look at the options available. To begin with, what's your full name? Sarah Bright. Can you spell your first and last name? There are so many variations. Sarah is S-A-R-A-H and Bright is B-R-I-G-H-T. Got that. And what is the address of the property to be insured? 33 Primrose Avenue, Perth, Western Australia. And the postcode? 6151. Could you let me know a little about the property? Well, it has around 200 square metres. There are three bedrooms on the upper floor, along with a bathroom and toilet. On the ground floor, there is a kitchen, living room, small workroom, and a utility room. On the right-hand side of the house, there is a single garage. Does it have a garden? Yes. There's about 15 square metres of garden at the front and about 20 square metres at the back. Does it have any security measures? Yes. All the windows have double locks and the front and back doors both have a five-lever mortise deadlock. There are also smoke alarms in four of the rooms, including the kitchen, and there is a burglar alarm. That's great. Before the conversation continues... You have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Now let's look at some of the things we can offer you. To begin with, we have our contents insurance. Our contents insurance covers the items in your home that aren't covered as part of a typical buildings insurance policy. We can cover your household goods, including non-permanent fittings such as carpets, personal belongings in the house or outbuildings, including garages and sheds, and money in the home. We can also cover contents temporarily moved to another home, replacement locks if your keys are stolen, items kept in the garden, the contents of your freezer, and the cost of alternative accommodation whilst insured repairs are carried out. Valuables can be covered up to a total value of $15,000. This includes things such as jewellery, watches, furs, items or sets or collections of gold, silver or other precious metals, works of art, Sets of stamps, coins and medals. That sounds pretty comprehensive. Yes, but it's important to know what it doesn't cover too. The policy doesn't cover theft from a vehicle unless the item was hidden and the thief had to break in to find it. So a sat-nav left on your dashboard wouldn't be covered, but a handbag locked in the boot would be. The policy also doesn't cover business equipment like tools, corporate credit cards, pets and other animals, bikes, camping equipment, wear and tear or damage to sports equipment, contact lenses and hearing aids, and certificates and documents, for example, losing your passport. So there's a lot not covered. Yes, but the details are pretty standard for what's in the market. You can add things at low cost, though, for example. There is a pet cover you could add, and cover for bicycles is also available. 
Also, we have something called personal possessions cover. Your whole household's belongings will be protected if they're taken away from home. They'd be covered against being lost, accidentally damaged or stolen. What sort of thing would that cover? It covers clothes, jewellery, watches, mobile phones, cameras, glasses, sunglasses, laptops, MP3 players, handheld video games and credit cards, wallets and purses. All these things are covered in the home with the contents insurance. But this covers you and your family at the same address when you're out of the house. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a man giving an information talk about a new culinary village. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the information talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening everyone and thank you for coming to this information evening. My name is Edward and I'm going to tell you a little about the new culinary village that opened recently in the centre of town. First I'd like to orientate you a little. The culinary village is on the old site of Acton's department store. It is sited on the ground floor only, while the upper floors are now used for office space. As you come in through the main entrance, there will be the information kiosk immediately on your right. The staff there will be able to give information to visitors regarding directions, any special offers of the day, and any other pertinent information of the day. The ground floor of the building is circular, and we call this the atrium. Going round on the right, the first restaurant you will find is a Japanese one called Origami. This serves many Japanese specialities and has had great reviews in the local paper. The next restaurant is Asian Fusion. As its name suggests, this restaurant's menu offers an eclectic mix of foods from all over the continent. I always see this restaurant full of Asian clientele, enjoying the blend of Indian, Thai, Chinese and other cultures' cooking traditions. I think this is a good recommendation. The next restaurant is the Blue Lobster Seafood Restaurant. This is currently undergoing renovation after a small fire during the final construction work. We hope that it will be open very soon so that you will be able to sample its amazing menu. After the Blue Lobster, there is the fire exit. This is important to know about, although we hope, of course, that you won't have to use it. All the restaurants also have one at the rear of their premises so that you will be safe if the worst happens. Next is the Fast Fish. As the name again suggests, this is a fast food establishment that specialises in fish and seafood. This establishment has the advantage of being open all day and evening, unlike some of the others, which serve only at lunch and dinner times. This means you'll be able to eat your favourite fish and chips whenever you want. The next establishment is a classic French restaurant known as the Little Bordeaux. This is a cosy restaurant that really creates the feeling of a genuine Bordeaux bistro. The little Bordeaux can get very busy, so a reservation is recommended so that you're not disappointed. Finally, there is the American Burger Diner. With a classic 50s feel, 
you'll be able to enjoy various American favourites such as hot dogs, steaks and of course different types of burger. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the information talk and answer questions 16 to 20. So, let me now give you some more information regarding the Culinary Village. First of all, the village is open from 10 in the morning until 12 at night. On public holidays, these hours will vary, and so the Culinary Village's website should be consulted, which is where you will also find the opening hours for the individual restaurants. Every year, the Culinary Village will hold a fine dining festival for a week. The local newspaper has agreed to sponsor this event and will therefore carry all details of what will be going on. Details won't be found online, so keep a lookout so that you can get something special from your favourite restaurant. The maitre d' or manager of any of the individual restaurants will be happy to handle any complaints that you might have, but if you find a problem with the facilities of the culinary village, just go to the information kiosk and the staff there will handle your complaint. Do not do this on the contact us section of the culinary village's website as these messages will not get answered. One frequent question that we've received recently has been about tipping. People want to know how much to tip, whether to tip only the waiter or include the kitchen staff and how to tip. We've asked the restaurants and they say that people should not be embarrassed to consult their table waiter or waitress. They will be happy to tell the diners the restaurant policy. You won't need to bother the maitre d' or manager or anything like that. By the way, none of the restaurants has toilet facilities. These are located in the centre of the atrium. There is no charge for diners using the toilet facilities, but you should ask your restaurant's maitre d' for a token which will give you access. That is the end of section 2. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear four students discussing their presentation. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hey Lucy, do you know when Jake and Emily are coming? They told me they'd be here at 3, so don't worry, Brian. They'll be here any minute now. Oh look, there they are. Hi Jake, hi Emily. Hi Lucy, hi Brian. Hi guys. Thanks for coming. Are you ready to discuss our presentation? Oh yes, we've been working hard on it. So, where are we? I checked in with Professor White, who supervises our usual seminar, and he said that the seminar time wasn't the best occasion for doing our presentation, as he wanted to review essays then. He said we'd be better off doing it at the start of the next lecture. I'd prefer the seminar, as there'll be a lot fewer people watching. So would I, but that's what he said. Did he say how we'd be graded? Yes, uh, there are four ways he'll grade us. Knowledge and understanding... 
examples and analysis, organization, and relevant language usage. That'll be hard when there are four of us together. Yes, but he said that for the first three he'd grade us together, and only for the last would he grade us separately. That's fair enough. We'll all be responsible collectively for those first three, but our language use will be an individual thing. Yes, that's fair. Did he give you any rubrics or anything? I asked him about that, but he said they're all on the website and that we can find them there. Yes, I've already checked them when I was online in the department office and found them. Good. Now, Emily, you're doing that PowerPoint with regards to this presentation. Is that right? Yes, I'm doing it, but I'm afraid my laptop has not been working right. I'll need to borrow one to get it done. You can use my old one. It, it works perfectly well. I'll bring it round this evening. Oh, good. Thanks. Do we need to book any special equipment? I don't think so. Actually, there's one thing. The projector in the room where we'll be doing the presentation is a bit old, and we'll need a particular adapter to connect to it. The technology department has them. I'll make sure I get one for the big day. You now have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. One of the things we'll need to focus on is the plastics recycling process. How should we start that? To begin with, we need to look at all the starting points for where the plastics come from. There are various sources. First, there is the agricultural waste. That's right. Then there's commercial and industrial waste. Aren't they the same thing? No. Commercial waste tends to be nearly all plastic packaging, while industrial waste is much more varied. Finally, there's municipal waste. And what's next? We'll look at the initial processing of the plastics. After the plastic is collected from their sources, it's cleaned and then sorted. That's right. Then, as it's usually pretty bulky, the size is reduced, usually by compression. How is the plastic treated in the recycling process? The reclaimed plastic is fed into a cutting machine and then heated. When warm, the plastic is fed through a dye to form plastic spaghetti that can be then cooled in a water bath. The next process is to reduce the spaghetti to pellets that can then be used for the manufacture of new products. What kinds of things are recycled plastic good for? Various things and different processes are needed to create them. Tubes, for example, are manufactured with a process called extrusion. What happens? The reclaimed plastic is forced along a heated tube by an Archimedes screw, and the plastic polymer is shaped around a die. The die is designed to give the required dimensions to the product and can be interchanged. What else is made? Blow molding can be used to create bottles, and film molding to make bags and sheets. Injection molding is also used, and that can make a variety of different items. Well, I think that'll be enough material to cover the recycling process. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear part of a psychology lecture on personality inventories. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everyone. In today's psychology lecture, we shall be looking at the various personality inventories that are used around the world. Personality inventory tests are designed to systematically elicit information about a person's motivations, preferences, interests, emotional makeup, and style of interacting with people and situations. Personality measures are most frequently interviews, but can also be in-basket exercises, observer ratings, or self-report inventories. A psychologist need not be present when the test is given, and the answers can often be scored by a computer. Personality self-report inventories typically ask applicants to rate their level of agreement with a series of statements designed to measure their standing on relatively stable personality traits. This information is used to generate a profile used to predict job performance or satisfaction with certain aspects of the work. Personality is described using a combination of traits or dimensions. Therefore, it is ill-advised to use a measure that taps just one specific dimension, for example, conscientiousness. Rather, job performance outcomes are usually best predicted by a combination of personality scales. For example, people high in integrity may follow the rules and be easy to supervise, but they may not be good at providing customer service because they are not outgoing, patient and friendly. The personality traits most frequently assessed in work situations include extroversion, emotional stability, agreeableness, conscientiousness and receptivity to experience. These five personality traits are often referred to collectively as the Big Five or the Five-Factor Model. While these are the most commonly measured traits, the specific factors most predictive of job performance will depend on the job in question. When selecting or developing a personality scale, it is useful to begin with inventories that tap the Big Five, but the results from validity studies indicate some of these traits are more relevant than others in predicting how well work is done. Objective personality testing began with Woodworth's personal data sheet in 1917. This test was developed to identify soldiers prone to nervous breakdowns during enemy bombardment in World War I. Soon after, many competing personality tests were developed for use in industry. Many of these tests, like Woodworth's, focused on the construct of employee maladjustment and were deemed important in screening out applicants who would create workplace disturbances. The first multi-score personality questionnaire was published by the US psychologist Robert Bernreuter in his 1931 book, The Personality Inventory. It comprises 125 items to be answered and yields scores on six variables. The Ben Reuter inventory became widely used quickly after it was first published, but it also attracted many detractors who questioned its usefulness and theoretical basis. Many different inventories followed, although the Ben Reuter inventory continued to be popular. It is important to recognise some personality tests are designed to diagnose psychiatric conditions, for example, paranoia, schizophrenia and compulsive disorders rather than work-related personality traits. The Americans with Disabilities Act considers any test designed to reveal such psychiatric disorders as a medical examination. There are now various examples of personality inventory that can be used to assess people. The personality inventory used most often for diagnosing psychological disorders is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, generally referred to as the MMPI. It consists of 550 statements that the test taker has to mark as true, false or cannot say, and answers are scored according to how people correspond. The MMPI was originally developed and is still used for the diagnosis of serious psychological disorders. However, enough responses have been collected from people with less severe problems to allow for reliable scoring of responses from these persons as well. 
Many people with no severe disorder are now given the MMPI as an assessment tool when they begin psychotherapy, with scoring geared toward personality attributes rather than clinical disorders. Another popular inventory used to diagnose psychiatric conditions is the California Psychological Inventory. This is based on less extreme measures of personality than the MMPI, and it primarily assesses traits, including dominance, responsibility, self-acceptance, and socialization. In addition, some parts of the test can specifically measure traits applicable to academic achievement. Now, are there any questions before we look more closely at some of these tests? That is the end of Section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of listening test 19. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.